Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to uh, encourage you to pick up your copy of my first novel, Slime Incorporated. It is available as an ebook, an audiobook, uh, or a paperback, and it's a well-paced uh, novel that has many nice nods to the classic era of detective fiction, but with a modern feel. And we're averaging in excess of a four-star average on uh, Amazon. I encourage you to check that out along with all my other ebooks and audiobooks and paperbacks through store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for Defense Attorney. Uh, the program was set to air over NBC as the defense rest. And at the last minute, NBC backed out of airing the series and it shifted over to ABC which in many ways could be a good fit. ABC was a network that, during the golden age of radio, really struggled. It was born out of a basically an antitrust situation because ABC used to be part of NBC. NBC had a red network and a blue network, and ABC was the blue network. However, it was held to uh, be too much of a monopoly for NBC, and it was broken up. And often, ABC struggled with budgets and program quality. However, it also uh, could have a little bit more experimentation and come up with some unique programs and really fit well with them that may not have fit well on other networks. Uh, this uh, We've got a total of three episodes from this series. Uh, the first one that are available, although there were 70 plus made, uh, the original air date on this episode is March the 31st of not, or, uh, excuse me, August 31st, 1951, and the title of the episode is Mike Tolley. Listen to Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney following this important reminder. On this long Labor Day weekend just ahead, there'll be an estimated 37 million drivers on the road. They are not all careful drivers, but we hope you are. Watch your own driving and watch out for the other fellow, too. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. Perhaps in order to get to your destination a bit sooner, you'll be tempted to step on the gas. Speed too great for safety under prevailing conditions is the violation most frequently reported as contributing to motor accidents. So slow down. Don't let death take your holiday. Ladies and gentlemen, to depend upon your judgment and to fulfill my own obligation, I submit the facts, fully aware of my responsibility to my client and to you as defense attorney. The American Broadcasting Company presents Miss Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney. chose law as a career, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Mike Pelly was one of the defenseless. Already convicted of murder in the first degree, he sits staring at the floor of his death cell, listening to the approaching steps of his final visitor. Hello, Mike. Hello, Miss Bryant. Hi. Mike, I've just come from the Court of Appeals, and they... Say it's all right, Miss Bryant. You don't have to say it. As soon as I saw your face, I knew the answer. Mike, I'm sorry. Of course, there's still the governor. I'll try for a stay of execution. No, 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 no. no. Don't. Don't do it. Well, there's always a chance, Mike. Yes, yes. Always a chance. For what? Another 48 hours, another week, or another month. Another month of life, Mike. Oh, no, it isn't another month of waiting for death. I don't want to wait anymore. Don't I... give up. Not yet, Mike. Please don't. don't. give up. That's easy for you to say. Is it? What am I supposed to do? Die with a smile on my face? Am I supposed to say, 
put a great joke on the state of executing the wrong man. I didn't say that. No, oh, no, you didn't say it, but it's easy for everybody else to be calm and logic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Brown. I apologize. It's all right, Mike. No, it isn't. I've given you a rough time right from the start, and you don't deserve it. Not the way you've been pitching. It's my job. Oh, I don't know what gets in him. I just can't explain it. I, well, if I was guilty, if I was dying for a reason, maybe then I could die like a man. But I'm going to die for something I didn't do. And I... Oh, yes, I had a fight with Davidson. Sure, I admitted that. But that's all. He was alive when I left. I didn't kill him. I'm just a storekeeper. I'm not a murderer. Mike, have you told the truth all the way? Are you sure you didn't go back to Davidson's store after the fight? Oh, no. No, I told you a hundred times. I closed my shop for the night and I went home. I saw Davidson through the window of his store. He was counting cash. He was getting ready to close up, too. And... In court, you said that you lowered the awning on your store before you went home. Oh, it sure was the last thing I did every night before closing. The morning sun hits the store front. It fade the fabrics in the show window if I didn't do something to keep it yes, out. Yes, I know all that, Mike, but you've never explained why you left that iron crank handle outside the store after you cranked the awning down. Well, I, I just forgot it, that's all. I've forgotten it other times. It was always there in the morning. It wasn't there when they found Davidson's body. It was on the floor of his store beside his body, and it had been used to kill him. Well, it wasn't used by me. Is that why I'm here? Can they kill me because something I owned was used to kill somebody else? It didn't set well with the jury, Mike. You were convicted because of that crank handle. And the testimony of Mrs. Robert Latham. Oh, Mrs. Latham was lying. She told the jury she saw you run out of Davidson's store and jump into your car. She gave the license number of the car. She described it perfectly. A red Nash Rambler. Said she'd just driven up to park in the space right behind your car. Why wouldn't she look at me while she was testifying? Why'd she keep turning her head away? If I can understand that, it isn't easy to help send a man to an electric chair. Well, I left the store. It was my own store. And I walked to my car. I got in and I drove home. Davidson was in his place, and he was alive, and nobody else was around, and Ooh. nobody drove up to park behind me. That woman lied. She had no reason. Then she did it without a reason. Mike, there's always a motive in lying as well as in murder. And Mrs. Latham is absolutely without motive. She'd never seen you before. She had nothing against you. She didn't know Davidson or anybody close to him. I checked Well, then she was mistaken. She saw somebody the else. The license number she gave was yours, Mike. And you do have a red... It's not dry. I don't care. She had a thousand license numbers. And they were all mine. She didn't see me run out of Davison's door. I... Oh, it doesn't make any difference now, anyhow. I couldn't convince a jury, and I can't even convince my own lawyer. Mike, I tried to believe you. Oh, I know you have. You tried. It's not your fault. Like you said, there's a motive for everything, and... Everybody thinks I had a motive for killing Davidson. Well, you fought with him. Oh, yeah, I fought with <laughs> him. Do you ever see a fight between two shopkeepers, Miss Bryant? Two men who spend their lives indoors, never getting any sun, any exercise? Oh, yeah. That's some fight. A lot of yelling and pushing, a lot of punches that didn't hit anything. And wouldn't have hurt if they did. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was some fight. If only you hadn't gone looking for trouble. Oh, I know that now, but he broke his promise. When he rented me the store, I told him I'd set up a haberdashery. You know, shirts, ties, robes, and shoes. And he was selling suits in his own place. And two businesses like that, well, they could work in together. They'd help each other. And he started to put a haberdashery line in his own place, trying to cut me out. Well, I just wanted to get out of my lease so I could move. That's just all there was to it. We argued, yes, but I didn't kill him. Mike... Can you think of anything, anything at all that you haven't told me before? No. Because if there is anything, this is your last chance to tell me now. No, well, there's nothing else. All I want to say is, no matter how I've acted or what I've said to you, I am grateful for your help. Well, then why don't you prove that to me? Mike, sign this appeal to the governor. Give me a little bit more time to help you. Mike, how about it? No. But I might oh, be able to please, do something. Oh, please, Miss Bryan. I, I've resigned myself to what they're going to do tomorrow night. 
I'm not a brave man, but I've mustered whatever courage I have to take me from this life into the next. And if there's another delay, I'll lose that courage. And there's no hope for me. You know there's no hope for me. Is there anything you want? Is there anything that I could, I could have sent in here for you? Yeah. You go to church, Miss Brown? Mm-hmm. Well, then there's something you can do. You can say a prayer for me. Yeah, and while you're there, you say a prayer for Mrs. Robert Latham, too. Because I swear by all that's sacred, that woman lied. Marty, sometimes I wish you weren't an attorney. I hate to see you going into places like that. Well, thank you for driving me up, John. I'll have to come up here again tomorrow. You? Tomorrow? Why? City desk has assigned me to cover the execution. Ah, oh, John. It's a rotten assignment. But you just have to remember that the man in the chair is dying because he killed somebody else. Suppose the man in the chair is innocent. You mean you're not convinced Mike Pelly killed Davidson? I was convinced until just a few minutes ago. Marty, don't let your sympathy get the best of your judgment. No, this isn't sympathy, no. Mike Pelly's given up all hope of living. But he hasn't changed his story. And if he were guilty, I think he'd admit it now. Instead, he asked me to say a prayer for Mrs. Latham. Because she lied. Marty, why should she lie? She's a prominent and respected woman. She's Robert Latham's wife. You're pretty sold on Robert Latham, aren't you? I respect him. He left a big business to go to Europe and help with a rehabilitation program. He's, he's going to wind up as an ambassador, Marty. And he'll deserve it. How can you doubt the wife of a man like that? Just the same, I'd like to hear her story once more. Because if Mike Kelly is innocent, we've only got till midnight tomorrow to find out. <laughs> Another cocktail, Miss Bryant. Oh, no, thank you, Mrs. Bryant. Oh, it's no trouble to just bring one of the servants. No, really, no. I. I just want to talk about Mike Pelly. Oh! Drop my glass. I'm getting so clumsy lately. Uh, look, it's after four o'clock, Miss Bryant. I have some guests coming. I should be preparing for them. Couldn't you. Uh, could you come back another day? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Latham. Mike Pelly's execution is scheduled for tomorrow night, you know. But he'll get a reprieve. The governor will surely give him a reprieve. You will get one, won't he? No, Mrs. Latham. There will be no reprieve. Tomorrow night. So soon. Why are you so surprised, Mrs. Latham? It's been in all the newspapers. Well, I don't I don't read that sort of news. It's not I avoid anything connected with, with murder and that sort of thing. Even when you have been the principal state witness against the man who is to be executed? So what can I do? What do you want to see me? I don't about? like to see a man die without reason, that's all. Are you sure you didn't make a mistake in your testimony? Yes, I'm sure. You're certain that the man who ran from Davidson's store was Mike Pelly? Miss Bryant, you asked me all this at the time. I'm asking you again. Are you certain? Yes, yes, I'm certain. You're certain it was Pelly's car you saw, too? I told you it was a red car. I took the license Did you number. see him inside the store? Did you see him kill Davidson? No, no, I told you. I just driven up to park when he came running out. Well, then you didn't know he'd committed a murder in that store. No, how could I? You didn't know that a crime of any nature had been committed. No. Then why did you take the license number of Pelly's car, Mrs. Lake? Miss Bryant, I don't... Do you make a practice of taking license numbers of all the cars you happen to park behind? No, out? but I saw him running. All the stores seemed to be closed for the night, and I thought that he'd been robbing one of them. That's why I took the number. But you didn't call the police. No. No, after I, after I thought about it, I decided that nothing was wrong. There was no burglar alarm. But anything. you called the police two days later, though. After I'd read about the murder. I thought you avoided reading that sort of news. Miss Bryant, I, I don't have to discuss this with you. I, I have guests coming, and I must ask you to leave. All right, Mrs. Latham, I hope you'll have a very pleasant evening. I, I haven't intended to be rude, but I do want to forget all this, and I'm not feeling well. well neither is Mike Pelly. I don't know what your evening is going to be like, but I know what his is going to be like. Sometime tonight, they'll shave out a round spot on his head. They'll slit the leg of his trousers and they'll ask him what he wants for his last meal tomorrow. Why are you telling me? Just that? in the hope that you might be interested. Why should I be? What is it to me? He killed a man, didn't he? It's what he deserves, isn't it? Goodbye, Mrs. Lee. No, wait, wait, wait. Just a minute, Miss Bryan. 
Why don't you do something for him? Why don't you help? Why don't you, Mrs. I will. I will. I'll do anything. I, I have money. I'll pay you for every cost. You could get it and commute it to life in prison, but there are ways of doing that, aren't there? You really do want to help him, don't you? Yes, yes, I'll do anything. Well, then you've got a deal, Mrs. Latham. There's only one thing I want you to do. Tell the truth. just about sums up my little interview with Patricia Latham, Judd. Well, it sounds like it was quite a session. But after all, Marty, she repeated the same answers that she gave you in court. Yeah, yeah, but not in the same way. In court, she was just nervous. Now she seems pretty close to being hysterical. Well, that's strange, Aaron. No, it isn't really strange. A death sentence is just words. You see the condemned man. He's sentenced, but he's still alive. That woman's just realizing that Pelly is really going to die and that the words are about to become fact. Patricia Latham's going to pieces. Only one thing could cause that, Judd. Tremendous struggle with her own conscience. Now, wait a minute, Marty. You're not thinking that Patricia Latham murdered Davidson, are you? I don't know. I'm just convinced that Mike Pelly didn't. Marty, get back to the roots, the motive. For days I helped you check on her. She never knew Davidson or Mike. No, maybe not. But there's a connection someplace. There's a link that we've got to find. Judd, take me to Davidson's store. Again, Marty, we've been there a hundred times. Not since the trial ended four months ago. Somebody else probably has the store by now. Pelly's place, too. No, Davidson owned the property, and both places are padlocked till probate. Nothing will be changed. Well, what do you want to see this time? Same things as before. The windows, the awning, the place where Mrs. Latham said she parked, and the line of vision between there and the entrance to Davidson. Marty, I don't want to be vulgar, but... Well, whatever happened to the evenings we used to spend necking... Ah, oh, Judge, you know how I feel about you. But I don't think I could ever feel free for an evening again if it came at the expense of Mike Pilly's life. Ah. With a few well-chosen words, Counselor, you've just made me feel like a heel. I didn't mean it that way. I know, honey, but you're right. Well, I'm ready for duty every night for the next month. We don't have a month. It's 10 p.m. We've got exactly 26 hours. <laughs> That's it, honey. She could see everything, all right. Her story still holds up. Yeah. The shopping district gets pretty deserted at night, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. All the shops are closed by 8 o'clock. Hey. What? Everything is closed by 8. So what was Mrs. Latham doing here that night? Pelly said he'd closed up. Stores here aren't the kind she'd shop in anyhow. Men's wear. You should have paid closer attention at the trial, Judge. Huh? Mrs. Latham said she'd just been driving through on the way to a theater party. She dropped a lighted cigarette on the floor of her car. She pulled over to the curb to pick it up. <laughs> well, there goes my claim to fame as a shamus. <laughs> but, uh, don't I rate a kiss for trying? No, Judge, somebody's coming. Huh? Oh, it's just a special cop. He's trying the doors to the shops, making sure they're locked. Evening. Good, Good evening. evening. You didn't try the doors to Davidson's or Pelly's. No need to with those padlocks on the doors. But, Chad, the door to Davidson's store wasn't locked the morning his body was found. How come that special policeman didn't discover the open door the night of the murder? Hey, that's a thought. Hey, hey, fella. Me? Yeah, we'd like to talk to you. What's the trouble, ma'am? Oh, there's no trouble, officer. Uh, do you work in this district here every night? Yeah, Merchant's Police and Protection Service. Why? How long have you had this section? Oh, a little over two years, I guess. Were you on patrol around here the night that Mr. Davidson was killed? The guy who owned the suit store, yeah. But I wasn't around just when it happened. Well, what time do you make your rounds? I mean, you have a, a fixed schedule? Uh-huh. I check this block like now around 11 p.m. I come through again about 2 a.m., then about 5 a.m. The coroner's report showed that Davidson was killed at about 8.15, Marty. I know. Officer, how come you didn't discover that the door to Davidson's store had been left unlocked that night? I had no reason to discover it, lady. Davidson didn't take our service. Uh -huh. Ah, that answers that, Marty. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, just a second. Yeah? Uh, I saw you drop something in the doorway of that last door that you tried. Just a card showing the door's been checked. I drop one on each call. Oh, I see. Well, you tried practically every door on this street. Do all the merchants subscribe to your service? Just about. 
Was Mike Kelly a subscriber? No. He was pretty new around here, though. Maybe the salesman hadn't got to him yet. Guess him and Davidson was the only ones on this block who didn't take the service. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. You bet. So long. Uh -huh. Judd, what do you think of him? Uh, he's just a working guy, Marty. A lot of ex-servicemen on jobs like this. Some of them study for the regular police force. And this watchman stuff is sort of a fill-in and helps them get experience. Do you think he's all right? I imagine so. I can't say as much for the outfit he works for, though. Why? What do you mean? The uh, Merchants Police and Protection Service, as they call it, is a racket. It's run by Chuck Duffy, a graduate of the Federal Pen in Atlanta. His uh, salesmen are torpedoes from the same school. Wow. Well, pretty hard to say no to salesmen like that. Not many people do say no, as you can see from the cards in the doorways. Well, the only ones who didn't subscribe were Davidson and Mike Kelly. Now one is dead and the other is about to be executed. Yeah. And that could add up to something. And we got to find out. Let's go. Well, there's only one joker in the deck, though, Marty. Yeah, I know. Patricia Latham. Mm -hmm. Only I could find some way to discredit her testimony. Some way to convince the state that she might be lying. Well, you've checked her a hundred times, Marty. She's a reputable woman. How could you discredit Robert Latham's wife? She wasn't always Latham's wife. We don't know anything about her before she came to this part of the country. There might be something in her past that we haven't uncovered. You mean she might have been in jail at some time or involved in some crime? Well, that's possible. We'd have found out about it, Marty. Why? A crime committed in some other place? Some conviction under a false name? Well, even if such a thing existed, we'd never find it. Not without fingerprints or some form of identification that could be checked reliably without a state police. And there are 48 states. We don't even know where she came from. We could find out from the Hall of Records. A marriage license. Marriage license. Hey, there's a better way than that. A way we can get fingerprints, too. Oh. Forget her marriage license. Her driver's license is the thing we want. The application will not only tell us where she came from originally, but her thumbprints will be on it as well. No, not necessarily. That fingerprinting is optional, not mandatory. She might not have given her prints. Why would a reputable woman refuse, Marty? If she did refuse, it would mean she had something to hide. With Mike's life at stake, the police might be interested in just a little fact like that. Oh, Judd, I think you're wondering. <laughs> well, that's what I keep telling you. <laughs> hey, look. I've got friends at the Motor Vehicle Bureau. You keep your eyes open for an all-night diner or a drugstore. I'll phone and have them start digging. No, you better go yourself, because there isn't much time. Well, what'll you do? Go to police headquarters? For what? We haven't actually got anything on Mrs. Latham yet. Don't forget Chuck Duffy and his possible motive. I want to check the reports on his gang. Past crimes won't connect them with this one. No, but you know strong-arm men, Judd. Some of them use guns, some use knives. They all have favorite weapons. I want to see if any one of Duffy's hooplins had a habit of committing assault with makeshift weapons. Common things, like a piece of pipe. Or an awning crank? That's the idea, John. That might give us a lead at that. So you check Mrs. Latham, I'll check Duffy. Drop me at a cab stand and meet me at police headquarters when and if you get anything. And hurry, Judd, hurry. Good morning, honey. Hi. Quite a stack of police reports you got there. Yeah, and they're all on the Duffy mob. What did you find? You're going to be disappointed, Marty. I found nothing. Absolutely nothing. Oh, Judd, what do you mean? I mean that Patricia Latham not only didn't leave her fingerprints on her application for a driver's license, she hasn't even got a driver's license. She hasn't got a license? Are you sure of that? I sure, Marty. It's daylight outside. I've been going over those files all night. But, Judd, that proves she gave false testimony. She said she drove up and she parked behind Mike's car in the night of the killing. And she can still say the same thing, Marty. The only thing it would prove is that she was driving without a license. And that won't save Pelly from the electric chair. Well, could her license records be lost? No. Now, the only possibility is that an old license expired. She forgot to renew it. Can't you check on that? We could check it easily if we knew the year she made her first application. But we don't. The boys at the Bureau are still digging for me. If they come up with anything, they'll call me here. Well, what time is it? It's almost 8 a.m. And what have you found in the Duffy gang? A stack of assault charges against a man named Roy Nichols. Usually assault with a dangerous weapon. And his choice of weapons has always been made on the spur of the moment. Things like a flat iron, a jack handle, a rock. Uh -huh. Just the sort of boy to work somebody over with an awning crack if he saw one at hand. Yeah. He look anything like Mike Pelly. I mean, could he be mistaken for Pelly on quick sight? No, uh, uh Here's his photograph. Oh, no. Well, I hope the boys at the Motor Vehicle Bureau find something. Well, we can't wait for them. You call them and tell them you're not going to be here. Where can I tell them to reach me? At Mrs. Latham's. We've failed at everything else. Why would I lie? Why would I do such a horrible thing to 
a man I've never seen before. I don't know your motive, Mrs. Latham. You'll never get another chance to tell the truth. Tomorrow will be too late. Think about it, Mrs. Latham. Mike Kelly has only 12 hours to live. You're the only one who can save him. I offered you money to help. I offered to do anything. Oh, I think that's for no, me. No, no, no. It's the call that I've been waiting for. It's my husband. I placed a transatlantic call last night, and they've been trying to locate him in Germany. I've got to talk to him. Please, please go into the other room. Come on, Marty. Must be a phone extension in here someplace, Marty. I don't see one. Uh, uh, there, in the corner. Yeah. I see you've located the extension, Miss Bob. Uh... It's all right. It is your call, not mine. I'll be in here when you finish. Hello? Yeah, George, shoot. Applied five years ago, huh? And comes from where? Yeah, I got it. Oh, what's that? Uh, spell it. A-C-H-R-O. I got it. A chromatopsia. Yeah, it may help. Thanks. Bye. That was the Motor Bureau, Marty. They located an old application, but no license. She was rejected. Physical disability. A chromatopsia, whatever that is. You ever hear of it? I don't know. I might have. Is that all they could tell you? That's all. Except for her place of birth came from Brookville, West Virginia. Brookville, West Virginia? Mm-hmm. Judd, that's where that fellow, that Roy the, Nichols, came from. The hoodlum you had the file on? Yeah. And Marty, I, what's the matter? Well, there's something else to that word, that a chromatopsia. A chrom- oh, Judd, if that means what I think it means, it... Come on. Right. Mrs. Latham. Why can't you leave me alone? Yes, we will, in just a minute. When did you see Roy Nichols last? I, I don't know anybody by that name. Don't lie, Mrs. Latham. Not again. You came from the same town in West Virginia. Well, I don't remember All right, name. Mrs. Latham. It's my mistake, I guess. I only have one more question for you. It's a very simple question. You can see Mr. Barnes quite clearly, can't you? Yes. Tell me, Mrs. Latham, the necktie he's wearing. What color is it? Marty, what... What color is it, Mrs. Latham? It's... It... Go ahead. It... You can't answer me, can you? Because you're colorblind, aren't you? <laughs> Sure, a chromatopsia. That's what it means. She is colorblind. Well, she couldn't have seen Mike Kelly get into a red car, she described, because all colors look gray to her. She described a red car because somebody told her to describe a red car. Oh, who was that, Mrs. Latham? Roy Nichols. I was in love with Roy once, years ago, back home. I didn't know what it was. I was only 17. He came here after Davidson was killed and he told me what to say... He had pictures of us together, old letters of mine. He said... He said he'd ruin Robert's career if I didn't say and do what he told me. I wasn't thinking of myself. I was thinking of my husband. You think your husband is the kind of a man who'd want an innocent man to die to protect his career? No, no, that's why I was calling Robert. I wanted to tell him everything, say goodbye. I wasn't going to let Ellie die. In the, in the desk there, there's a telegram I was getting ready to send to the governor as soon as I spoke to Robert. Telegram is here, all right, Jen. A box of sleeping tablets. <laughs> I should take them out and throw them away, Mrs. Latham, but I'm not going to because I want you to think. Think of the man that you married. Not only who he is, but what he is. He must love you very much. Yes, I can see that you love him. I do that. Well, then prove it to him. Have enough faith in him to let him see you through this. You're probably the most important thing in his life. Don't take yourself away from him. I won't. I promise. I'll take this telegram to the police. There are a few people they'll want to see. They can arrange to stop Kelly's execution. You'd better come down to headquarters yourself after a while. I know. Will you help me? Yes. That must be Robert's call. We'll leave you then. Come on, sir. Right. I don't know what to say. You know what to say. Remember, you're talking to the man who loves you. Hello? Yes, this is she? From from Frankfurt? Yes, I'm ready. Robert? Robert? Please don't hate me. I've got something to tell you. Come on, Chuck.
admiring your silly old newspaper and pay a little bit of attention to me. Huh? huh? Oh, I was just looking over the story. I think I wrote it very well. All I care about is that headline. Mike Kelly released. I think it's great. <laughs> Hey, listen to that tune on the jukebox. You know who's doing the vocal? Mm-mm. Mercedes McCambridge. You were expecting maybe Mario Lanza? I never knew she was a singer. Well, if she is, she'll need more than that record to prove it to me. Oh, you attorneys. <laughs> Always want proof. Proof, proof. <laughs> uh, you know something, Marty? Mm? I can't get Mrs. Latham out of my mind. How could she have ever been mixed up with a torpedo like Roy Nichols? You don't know very much about women, do you, Jeff? Huh? There are two men in every woman's life. The man she marries and the one she's glad she didn't marry. Every woman has a big mistake someplace in her past. Now, wait a minute. I don't like the sound of that, Marty. Were you ever in love with somebody else? <laughs> Makes you think I've ever been in love with anybody. Oh, now, stop kidding, Marty. I, I want to know. I'll tell my husband about my big mistake someday. I'll say to him, and once I was in love with a no-good heel, a newspaper man named Judd Barnes. Young lady, I shall drive you home, and this romance is ended. Ah, it's too bad. Because I was just going to ask you whatever happened to the evenings we used to spend necking. Oh, well, since you put it that way, I'll drive you home by way of the park. I've just heard Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney with Howard Culver as Judd. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. <laughs> defense attorney was written by Joel Murcott. The program is directed by Dwight Hauser. Next week, another exciting adventure with Mercedes McCambridge, defense attorney. Be sure to listen. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, uh, good job on the uh, investigation and a nice little cute part at the end uh, with her listening to Mercedes McCambridge sing. I do. I am sorry about the sound quality on this one. This one's like a 24K BPS uh, encode, which is a little low for what we do on the show. But still, it was an interesting episode and a good mystery. Though the way it played out, I did kind of wonder what we may even be in this position if she'd done a better job uh, or whoever she'd had helping investigate had done a better job of the trial. And now we turn to listener comments and feedback. And we just have a tweet from Jim uh, who has uh, actually just been uh, retweeting and favoriting so many of our programs. He writes in, love your podcast. Well, thanks so much. And you can follow the show at Radio Detectives and uh, retweet the episodes that you enjoy so that others can listen to them as well. All right, well, that will do it for now. Join us back here tomorrow for Boston Blackie and next Wednesday another episode of Defense Attorney. In the meantime send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends